Let me go ahead and read Revelation 11, verses 1 through 13, where we're at. Revelation 11, 1 through 13, then I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, if you guys remember, just remember from last week's study on, uh, in Revelation 10, that John is recommissioned to preach or to prophesy. Um, and so what we, what we learned last week is pretty much, uh, this week is going to be an extension of that. Okay? It's going to be an extension of that. So just kind of keep that in mind. That'll help kind of coming in. <coughs> All right. Revelation 11, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the outer court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire." And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Triune God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, help us uh, tonight, Lord, to understand your word and to understand our role, Lord, uh, what we should be doing uh, right here and now, how we should be living out our lives, the things that we should be thinking about, what we should be contemplating, and what we should be expecting, Lord, and, and, uh, and help us to see your grace, Lord, uh, as we go through uh, trials and suffering and persecution. Lord, help us to see that you do indeed give grace, Lord, and power to live out what you call us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, in Revelation 10, John was commanded to take and eat of the scrolls. You guys remember that? Which was, it was sweet in his mouth, but it was bitter in his stomach. The command to take the scroll, which contained the message of things to come, is now revealed through the next vision of this interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So remember that long study where we went through all six trumpets. And now chapter 10 and 11, they're like this little interlude. And if you guys remember, those interludes kind of function as like interlocking links to help connect uh, the different sections of Revelation Question. to each other. Um, okay, so it was the angel that ate the scroll, right? Johnny. Okay, it was, John, yeah, John yeah. ate the scroll and, and like it, he was sweet in his mouth and he got to his stomach, he was sour. What, what does that mean? Part, part of it, uh, uh, the symbolism in there is that, in a sense, because he's commanded to prophesy, which is to preach, basically. Okay, and in his witness, you know, it's there's a there for the Christian and, and for John, you know, there is a delight in sharing the word of God. So when the word of God is like on our on our lips, it's something sweet, you know. But the message that John is given, it's one of judgment and one of repentance uh, for for the idolatrous cultures and things like that. So in a sense, it's sweet because you're, yeah, you're giving out 
the word of God, but at the same time, it's a hard message because it's one of judgment, judgment. that has okay, to be preached. Okay, yeah, so it's the idea of calling the world to repentance. So you know, rather than being like a fluff preacher, and you know, just uh, kind of like the like the false prophets in Jeremiah, like everything's going to be fine, everything will work out. You know, the message that that uh, that John is given to give the world is no judgment is coming, and so it's a joy to preach God's word, but sometimes God God's word is hard. It's a hard word sometimes, but it still has to go out. So that's that's the the significance behind that there. And I, I know I must have missed out on a lot last week. You know, I, I just just from going over uh, chapter uh, chapter ten, I just know it was a whole bunch of stuff that was brought to the table. And then I, yeah, I missed out. On yeah, it, it's just it's kind of. Um, in a sense, John is just given a big vision of Christ again. Um, there, there was some, there's some uh, uh, controversy issues whether the angel is just an angel or if it's somehow Christ. Because the way the angel is described, Jesus is described with a lot of those same uh, descriptions in Revelation chapter 1. And, uh, so some commentators think that it's Christ, in a sense, being give, given his description as the angel of the Lord, like in the Old Testament, where, where Christ is, uh, the, the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. And so, so some commentators went that way. I ended up leaning toward that way, but some people just see it as a regular angel. But what the angel was doing, the significance of him standing on the, on the, the sea and, uh, and on the land, is basically saying that this is where he has dominion over. It's under his feet, so that he rules. And when the angel lets out his loud cry like a lion, basically that's his way of saying, this is mine. It's all mine, and then on, based on the authority that he has over the land and the sea and, and uh, every, everything in them, he gives John his mission, and he tells John, here, eat the scroll. Now you must go and prophesy. So that's kind of, I guess that'd be the big picture view of what's going on there, but it's just, uh, in a sense, kind of like in, in, back in Revelation 1. So you can, this is where, where the recycling pictures uh, of Revelation, I guess, here we go, uh, kind of come in uh, into play in Revelation one, we get the big picture of Christ. You know, we don't see Christ. You know, uh, he's not in a nativity anymore or anything like that. He's described, you know, with eyes of flames of fire and you know and stuff like that. The the, the very big, um, uh, it's just a big view of God and a big view of Christ. And that's what this angel, the image of the angel represents, and how he's described, is that Christ is bigger than all the circumstances that he's going to find himself in. So. Bigger. Yeah. Okay, so so then uh, so that's what make you or lead you to believe that that angel was it's Christ. That's part of it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's part of it. And so uh, the the it didn't make a difference um, in a sense with the interpretation of of John's mission whether the angel is Christ, represents Christ or is just an angel. The commission is still the same. That John still has to preach. No matter what, but in, in whatever way, um, uh, the authority of God is conveyed through the angel. Okay, so from there, if, if it's Christ, so that's, that, uh, I've, I felt that it was, you know, based on the, on the descriptions and, and, and things like that. Uh, but we didn't make a big stink about it if some people wanted to say, well, it's just an angel. You know, like, it, did, it didn't change the interpretation. But the, the big thing is, is kind of like, in a sense, like when, when God called Isaiah, uh, Isaiah needed to see a bigger picture of God than he had in order to be able to carry out his ministry. He needed to see. He needed that, yeah. him personally. Yeah. And oh, okay. Yeah, so it is... Unbelief or, or, or what? In a, in a sense, it's more like um, the idea that God is bigger than our circumstances in that sort of way. So like even Moses, like when, uh, you know, he knew about God. But he had never, in a sense, personally encountered. Oh, okay. So he had to see that in order for him to move forward. Yeah. Okay. And that's in that sort of way. So that he, you know, like Moses, especially, he needed to know that God was bigger than Pharaoh because at that point in his life, Pharaoh, Pharaoh was big. Pharaoh. Yeah, Pharaoh was the biggest <laughs> thing in the world. Uh, you know, and yeah, and knowing that there's a bigger God behind him gave him, you know, the vigor, uh, you know, to fulfill his calling and to go and, and actually confront Pharaoh because now Pharaoh seems puny. And so that's what John kind of gets, and that's what we get, in a sense, is that Christ ha that everything belongs to Christ, you know. And so it's uh, it's basically the Great Commission just stated in a, in a vision, you know, the Great Commission: all authority has been given to me. Go therefore, you know. So it it, it presents Christ having all authority, and then what's our response to that? Is to go, yeah. 
And that's basically what we see in John 10. So it's well. only known now. So that's what everyone needed to see. Yes. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, and it's to give us courage to go. To give us courage to go. And courage to live out the Christian life. Okay. Well, I yeah. have a question. I know uh-huh. it's a bit so. Am I, uh, when you come to James, they don't call the scroll, they call it the little book. The little book, yeah. That's, so a, that's another. The scroll that was like wrapped like a scroll, or was it actually a book? I, I was wondering, like, um, different versions? Or probably, a, a, probably a scroll. The What we know as like a book, like a codex, uh, that I, that hadn't been developed yet. Yeah, they were still, but so but there, but there are a with within the Greek, from what I understand, there are, there are some variations where some uh, some manuscripts uh, say book. Okay. Yeah, some manuscripts say book, but the meaning doesn't change okay. whether it's a scroll or a book. I picture yeah. a scroll because well, it's here. It's in my Bible scroll. So, yeah. But then, has, yeah, New, my New King German, New King James version has a little book. Ooh. Yeah, there is a textual variant that I that I remember reading that. Yeah, I didn't cover I didn't cover that, but I read it and all the and all this stuff. I, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, interesting information. So, okay, um, the command to take the scroll. Okay, uh, it contained the message of things to come. It, it's now revealed in this next vision of the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. If you guys remember this interlude, okay, where we're at, okay, uh, chapters ten and eleven are an interlude. They correspond, or it corresponds to the vision of the 144,000 and the international multitude in Revelation 7. That was an interlude as well between the sixth, uh, between the sixth trumpet and this, uh, uh, not trumpet, um, uh, the seal, between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. Okay, so we're, this, this kind of, uh, this pattern of interludes between the sixth judgment in whatever form and the seventh, that's what we're seeing again here. Okay, uh, the theme here is the protection of the church amid suffering. Okay, the purpose of the interlude seems to address the question of what the church on earth will be doing as the plagues of the trumpets are unleashed throughout the church age. Okay, basically it's answering the question, what is the primary ministry of the church? What is our primary calling as Christians, as a local church, as a, as a national, international church? However, however we take church, however we apply that. What is our ministry? In one sense, what on earth are we here for? This is kind of what this is answering. Okay? What is our duty as Christians? In Revelation 11, 1 through 13, help us answer these questions, and, they ho- and hopefully they will give us some confidence to carry out our mission. So here is the main point of this section that we need to see, okay? And it is that God's decrees to protect His people with His presence in order to assure their effective witness to and against the idolatrous world, which leads to their apparent defeat and the ultimate judgment of their oppressors. Okay? God's decrees to protect his people. That's what we're seeing, okay? We're seeing God's decrees. How is God going to take care of us? Okay? We've already seen that once in God's, uh, in the sealing of the 144,000, also in God marking uh, the people in uh, was it in Revelation nine, where we were at, where they uh, where they couldn't harm anybody until until the angel went out and marked the people of God. Okay, so this is kind of another way of displaying that image. That's what we're going to see. How is God going to protect us in our mission? Okay, so we're not left alone. Basically, so it's what we're going to be seeing. Okay, all right. So let's get into the text here. Okay. Verse 1 says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. All right, so some major interpretive strains uh, for this section, okay? One, okay, the dispensationalist futurist understanding, if you need to know what those terms mean, uh, just refer back to study one, refer back to the guide, okay? Uh, but the dispensationalist futurist understanding of Revelation, along with some modified futures views, projects these verses into the time of the tribulation immediately preceding Christ's final parousia. Okay, that's the return, okay? Basically, what this means is that this is, uh, that the temple, that uh, the way they interpret it, is that this is a literal physical temple that has been rebuilt in Jerusalem. Okay, and there are several churches already in the United States that I understand that have raised up enough money, okay, to rebuild the temple. Okay, but that's what this view is, is that they're saying that this is a literal temple, that it doesn't exist yet, okay, but when it gets rebuilt, this is what needs to happen in order for the, for the seven-year tribulation period to happen. 
Okay, so like if you guys have read like or you know the Left Behind books and a lot of the popular sort of interpretation of Revelation, that is this interpretation here. Okay, that the Jewish people are the are where God is going to return His focus, but they need to reinstitute sacrifices in the temple. Okay, two. There is the preterist understanding of Revelation. Okay, now this takes a similar literal approach, except because this is preterist, it's in the past. Basically, the preterist understanding is that this is the temple that was up in A.D. 70, before it was destroyed. Okay, this is the second temple. All right, so there, it refers to the same temple. But remember, in a preterist reading of Revelation, all of Revelation happened and was fulfilled in A.D. 70. So in, in that sort of reading, nothing in Revelation uh, is expected to be fulfilled further today. Okay, so that's another uh, major interpretive strain. And then uh, another th a third strain, some modified futurist perspectives relegate the narrative to the future, like uh, view one above, but they understand the description figuratively. They say that the temple is not necessarily, in a sense, a literal physical temple, but that the temple refers to, uh, to believing Jews. Okay, so in a sense, as, as God has, uh, in this sort of uh, interpretation, God has raptured the church, and the only people that God is dealing with now is Jews, and the Jews collectively are the temple. That's what this interpretation is saying. Okay, uh, another position, okay, is uh, similar, but it does not relegate the scene to the future. Rather, it identifies the outer court, uh, four and five are pretty much going to be our strongest interpretations, okay? Uh, it, it identifies the outer court with the professing but apostate church, which will be deceived and will align itself with unbelieving persecutors of the true spiritual Israel. So uh, the temple that's measured is the true believers, but the outer court, in, in this view, the outer court is, in a sense, uh, professing Christians, but they're not real Christians. Okay, there are people who say that they're of God, but they're not really of God. So this would be like false teachers within the church or false believers within the church. So this kind of makes like a, uh, almost like a two-church distinction. You have the true church, okay, as, uh, as, the, inner, as uh, the Holy of Holies, okay, as the, as the temple, but then the outer court represents people who just say that they're Christian, but they're really not, okay? So this is one interpretive take. The, there's a lot of commentators that take it that way. A final view, this is view five, understands the text figuratively but interprets the outer court as the physical expression of the true spiritual Israel which is susceptible to harm. So this one is instead of saying two churches or, or two different, uh, uh, separating the temple into, well, true and false, it's saying, no, they're both true but the inner court, or, or the, the Holy of Holies that gets measured, is going to be the spiritual, or, um, the spiritual life or the spiritual status of believers, but the outer court represents them in their bodies or in their local expression. Okay, so this one doesn't divide them. I think this will become a little bit clearer if it's not too clear. Is it, is it, is it jiving? Okay, let me put it this way, okay? I have a soul, okay, and I have a body, all right? The inner court would be my soul, and the outer court would be my body. Okay, it would be it would be like that. Okay, so it's still uh, uh, the the way four kind of separates. It makes two classes of people, but five keeps it uh, keeps it all as in a sense as as one people. But it's just that uh, the in the the inner or, or the the temple is the part of a of a person that we don't see. Okay, it's their spiritual status. Okay. And the outer court is what we see of them. And this is okay. another view, right? Yeah, this is, this is another view. Okay. Uh, who's this? Uh, Simon Kistemark. He said, we should not be discouraged about the use of symbolism to convey the truth about events to take place and such. Simon Kistemark says, symbolism is not a denial of historicity. Okay, so, I mean, this is, this is a tough part of the book, okay? Symbolism is not a denial of historicity, but a figurative method of communicating reality. Apocalyptic language has one of its basic characteristics, has as one of its basic characteristics, the cryptic and symbolic use of words and phrases. Okay? So that is more related to number five. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I think, 
Okay, so here's the question that we have to ask. Okay, so this is our first big, big dive here. Okay, uh, is this a physical temple? Okay, what is this? Okay, uh, is John referring to the temple in Jerusalem? Several points lead us away from this conclusion. Okay, one. Okay, the proposed late date of Revelation would mean that the temple is no longer standing. Okay, remember the temple was destroyed in AD seventy. The Romans went in there and they they beat up all the Jews and they tore the temple down. Okay. They did that. Revelation was written in the late first century, 90 to 95 AD. Okay? That means Revelation cannot be interpreted in a preterist understanding. And because it's at the end. Yeah, because the temple's already been destroyed. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's not there. So John can't be referring to something as that's going to happen in the future that he's seeing that's already, it's already happened. Yeah. That makes no sense to go backwards <laughs> that way. Okay? Two, because the second half of the interlude is phrased in symbolic terms, it would be contrary to expectations to understand the first two verses literally. Okay, that is just the nature of Revelation itself. It's making use of symbolic language. And even there, there's, a, there's a point here in the, in, the, in the text that I read already. It says, the city which is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt. Okay, so I mean, right away, we know we're in a symbolic book. So to all of a sudden say, well, this is a literal physical temple, really doesn't jive with the genre of the, of the book that we're in itself. Okay? Uh, three, with Christ having accomplished redemption by fulfilling the function of the temple and himself claiming to be the true temple, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant era was ended. Okay? So the emptiness of the temple of God's presence was revealed when the curtain was torn and God's final visible rejection of Judaism was in 70 A.D. Okay, that is, there's no need for this other temple. We don't need a third temple. Christ is the true temple. He's the temple that all the other temples were pointing to. Okay, the tabernacle was always pointing to Christ. The temple was always pointing to Christ. Once Christ comes, you don't need the signs anymore. And that's part of what the book of Hebrews argues is don't go back. <laughs> you don't go back to Judaism. That's a total rejection of Christ. You know, when you're, when you're in San Antonio... <laughs> you know, you don't need a sign that says, hey, go to San Antonio. You're there. You've reached your destination. You don't need the signs anymore. There's nothing to point to. You're, you're there. You made it. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, I already mentioned with Hebrews. Okay. So, uh, what is John referring to then? Okay, there's a couple of places, okay, in the Old Testament where the temple is measured. One of them is in Ezekiel 40 through 48. No, we're not going to read all those eight chapters, okay? Uh, these are some of the chapters that we went through in the Jesus in the Old Testament, okay? But here, Ezekiel, he receives a vision of a restored temple and the return of God's presence. In Ezekiel 48, the very last verse, it says the name of that city, okay, the name of that city will be the Lord is there. Okay, and the whole city, in a sense, the temple takes up the whole city of Jerusalem. Uh, a lot of people have, have pointed out that the measurements uh, that are given in Ezekiel 40 through 48 of the temple there, that that's, that's almost like, uh, uh, it's way bigger than the city. It's almost like the size of, of, uh, of, uh, of the state uh, or of their nation for the most part there. So that's how, you know, in a sense, that vision tells you that, hey, something bigger is coming. And the second temple that was that was built after uh, after the exile, that wasn't the fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision. It couldn't be. That temple was way too small, way too small. Okay, the measurement was a way of guaranteeing what it would be like, thus guaranteeing its protection. Okay, it was guaranteeing its protection. Likewise, in Revelation 11, the measuring, the measuring connotes God's presence. Okay, the measuring connotes God's presence, which is guaranteed to be with the temple community living on earth before the consummation. Remember, what was the temple? The temple was the place where you went to meet with God. It was where God localized His presence. Okay, the, in, in a sense, the closer... Uh, the closer that you got to the Holy of Holies, the holier you had to be, <laughs> okay? The holier you had to be. Why? Because that was where God, in a sense, that's where he chose to dwell specifically. The, the, the ark was considered his throne. It was his footstool. It was where he rested, 
Okay, so the further you got away from the Holy of Holies, the idea was that the less, uh, the less, uh, or the more unclean things were. Once you stepped in, you know, at least I'm trying to remember the tabernacle, but once you stepped in, like the, 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 first, uh, the first things that you, that you noticed, everything was made out of bronze. And then as you started getting closer, the metal started getting more refined. You went from bronze, and all of a sudden you're silver, but then you get inside, and all of a sudden everything is gold. And the te- you know in in the in the temple when the temple was built the whole holy of holies was all walled in gold, okay the cherubim they're uh, fifteen feet uh, their wingspans fifteen feet each, okay they were all they were all with gold they were all covered in gold the entire arcs covered in gold the walls inside the inside the temple inside the holy of holies is all gold why you were it, it, you know it showed how close you were to God that you were really in His presence and then the the, the priests. The high priest, he could only he couldn't bar, he couldn't barge in there whenever he wanted. He could only go once a year, and if he was unclean, he was going to be killed. And they would they would they, they would have like a bell on him and a rope and like uh the the, the idea was for, uh, from what I've read is that if he died, that rope had to be attached so that they could pull him out. They weren't supposed to go in there and go get him. They had to pull him out, you know. And so as long as the bell was moving, it's like he's alive. You know, he's doing it. And if the priest comes back out alive, it, it sort of symbolized that God had accepted atonement and that the people of Israel, in the sense that they were forgiven. Okay? So, in light of uh, the coming of Christ okay, and his fulfillment of all the old covenant expectations, Christ has to be the dominant lens through which we must view the fulfillment of Ezekiel's restored temple. Okay? So basically, this, what did Jesus say in John 2, 18 and 19? Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And what was he referring to? It says he was referring to his body, that he was the temple. He was the true temple that everybody should have been looking for. Consider that in Christ, the church is the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? If we're the body of Christ and Christ is the temple, we're that temple too. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. The Greek, uh, the Greek word there for you is plural. It's not singular. Okay? It's the body of Christ as a whole is the temple. Okay? 1 Peter 2.5 likewise says, it says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So with the new covenant, all believers individually and corporately have become the dwelling place of God. God's spirit is in us now. It's not in a building. Okay? It's not in a temple someplace you know, in, in Jerusalem or in some other city. God's spirit is in us. It's in us. We are that temple. So therefore, Christians, that is those who are identified with Christ are also presently identified with the temple. Okay? So when Jesus comes, you know, when he comes, he fulfills and replaces the temple. Now, the significance of the measurement, okay? This is uh, the significance of the measurement, basically, because it represents uh, protection, okay, or the, guar- uh, the guarantee uh, um, uh, of what the temple would be like, okay, that not a bit of it would be lost, okay, it's part of it when you measure it, it's like, uh, let's put it together and, Oh, it's a little shorter. Like, no, it was to guarantee the outcome. So what we're seeing here, the measurement of the temple is basically the equivalent of the ceiling of the 144,000. Okay? It's the, it's the same idea as the ceiling of the 144,000 back in Revelation 7. The measurement is to preserve the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Okay? It's God's protection. It's God's protection. All right? Now, the altar... The altar refers to the way that God's people now worship in the community. Okay, in line with, uh, with uh, Revelation 6, 9 through 10, it represents the sacrificial calling which entails suffering for the faithful witness. Okay, the close proximity of believers to the altar in 6, 9 through 10, remember they are under the altar in 6, 9 and 10, implies that both, uh, that both in that passage... And here they are not only worshipers but also priests who have brought themselves to be sacrificed on the altar of the gospel to which they have been called to testify. Remember, the altar was where you went and you offered your sacrifice. Okay? And so in, in a sense here, uh, the idea uh, is that 
uh, the ones being sacrificed or what goes on the altar now is our own selves. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you offering our, you know, our spiritual sacrifices, you know, our praises and things like that. You know, and all that comes through the gospel. I think Romans eight thirty five through 39 here as well. Okay, if you read those verses, there's a part where it says, we, you know, all the day long we're, ki we're killed. All day long. Basically, it says, you know, we're suffering for the sake of the gospel. But nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. But yet they're still, they're still in a sense, uh, there's a sense in which they're being led to slaughter. Okay, just like the animals were led to slaughter back in the Old Testament times. Hebrews 13, uh, 9 through 16, it also speaks of an altar that Christians, uh, that Christians worship at, who is Christ. Uh, I think it's uh, in Hebrews 13, 10, it says, uh, but we have an altar that other people don't have a right to, the Jews in particular. Okay, that is, we have a sacrifice that's better than every other sacrifice, Christ. And the Jews Christ. don't have a right to that. And they don't have a right to that. because in, in, in wanting to maintain their own sacrificial system, in light of Christ already coming, they're actually rejecting, uh, in a sense, they're rejecting the, the true sacrifice that God has provided for them in Christ. They're happy to have the signs, but not the fulfillment. Oh, so they and, took Christ out of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it, it, it's just like, like Jesus told the Pharisees, you know, um, uh, you search the scriptures, but these are they which speak of me. You know, and, and all the sacrifices, I mean, you know, you think about everything in the Old Testament, whether it was a feast, whether it was uh, even the furniture in the tabernacle, uh, all the sacrifices, it, everything had a way of pointing to Christ, to either his person or his work. You know, so like even the, even the candle in the, in the tabernacle, you know, it was like, you know, when Jesus said he's the light of the world, you know, part of that, the light that comes, that was the only light in the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle was a dark tent, okay? I think it had, it had goat skin that was, that was covering so that it, it, would be a, it would be opaque so that no light could get in there. So what's the only light that you have? Only that menorah, the candle. That's it, you know? And so for Jesus to say, I'm the light of the world, I'm the true light, you know, is that he, you know, in a sense, uh, the tabernacle, even, even that candle, you know, was pointing that way to Christ and the light that he would bring uh, in dark places, okay? And the ones who are worshiping, okay, uh, in the temple, this just refers to believers worshiping together in the temple community, okay? Basically, this is the church, okay? It's the community of believers gathered together for worship. Believers together, we make up the temple, okay? We make up the temple. And then going on in Revelation, it says, But do not measure the, the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over for the nations, and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay? Now, the outer court is still part of the visible temple, okay? but it is not where the significant worship happens. The significant worship is inside the temple complex itself, okay? uh, which contains basically the holy place, the altar mentioned, and the holy of holies, which is where the presence of God is. Okay? Now, that this court is not measured symbolizes those who are at the temple but never make it, in a sense, in the temple. Uh, or actually this is one of the, one of the interpretations, this is interpretation for some commentators therefore suggest that it represents professing Christians who are not truly saved, okay, that is that their faith is not genuine, all right? So in one sense, there, there's, a, there's a sense in which this sort of interpretation says that this is what we see, okay, we only see the outside of people, we only see professions, we can't look into hearts, okay, only God knows that, okay? However, the other, this is interpretation five, I think this other more plausible interpretation uh, suggests that the measured parts of the temple and the unmeasured part are both part of the temple complex. That is true. Okay, so it's not like they were completely separate. Okay, this is all part of the one temple. All right. Uh, which is the community of faith in which God dwells, but it is the earthly expression of the temple. So under this interpretation, which was uh, interpretation five, the, the measured part is what God sees, that when he looks at his church, God sees the people who really do believe. 
God sees the people who have real faith. Okay, uh, and, and, uh, Theologically, they call this the invisible church. It's the church that's visible only to God because God can peer into the hearts. Okay, But then the outer court represents the visible church, what we see. Okay, What we see. All right? In other words, the temple, the altar, and those who worship there are measured, okay, who are measured, they represent simply the protection of worshipers in their worship. This is the seal, okay? This, this is the guarantee that the, the, the ones who are there in the temple, that those worshipers will continue to worship, that their spiritual life will not falter. In a sense, it's basically saying we can't lose our salvation because God himself is the one who is behind He's the one who has sealed us, who's marked us, and now he's the one who's commanded us to be measured as well so that not one of his is lost. Okay, and again, this is what you think Romans 8 here. You think John 10, I am the good shepherd. I will lose none of the sheep. Not a single one of them will be lost. Nothing in heaven and earth can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. This, this is just another way of saying that, Okay. Is what this is. It, it guarantees that no matter what happened to us, no matter what happens, no matter how much suffering we go through, God will not let our faith falter. He will not let us go beyond, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, whatever. So, uh, that will not be uh, tempted beyond what we can handle, so that we would fall away. Okay, that will not happen to the people who are measured, who are sealed, who are marked out by God. Okay. But the unmeasured court, however, leaves these true believers exposed to being trampled by the nations. Basically, even though we're true believers, we're still going to suffer. We're still going to suffer. We're, we're not exempt, okay? Being a Christian doesn't put us on a yellow brick road, <laughs> okay? It gives us a walking stick <laughs> and a road to travel, and, you know, and a quest is kind of what it gives us, okay? And it's, it's not an easy one. G.K. Beale, he says... Uh, uh, I'll leave that up. Okay, but G.K. Bill, he says that it is an essential part of the temple complex, okay, is, is suggested by the assumption in verse 2 that it was formerly under the protection of the temple walls but is not to be cast out of that protection. The symbolic aspect of the portrayal, and no, I don't have the quote, I thought I did. The symbolic aspect of the portrayal comes to the fore in that John is certainly not saying that part of the material temple building is to be picked up and thrown outside, okay? So that's how we know that this is symbolic and, and not literal too, okay? The outer court is cast out and not measured, or that it is cast out and not measured, means that it will not be protected from various forms of earthly harm, okay? So again, Christians can still experience economic oppression or economic struggles. Christians can still be harmed physically, okay? We can still get sick, <laughs> you know, we can still suffer, Christians can still get cancer, Christians can still experience tragedy. But none of those things will be so overwhelming to us that we'll curse God or that we'll leave our Christian faith. That's the significance of the measuring and that whatever's not measured is basically, it's parts of our lives that are still susceptible to suffering. And notice that the court and the holy city are used interchangeably here. Okay, so as it says, um, but do not measure the court outside. But then if you look right at the end uh, of verse 2, it says they will trample the holy city. Okay, so those are kind of used interchangeably in the text. Okay, so the court and the city, the holy city, both represent the people of God who will be persecuted. Okay, both of those terms. All right. Now, what is meant by 42 months? Okay, so it says they'll be trampled for 42 months. All right, the number of the 42 months is not literal, but figurative. If you guys were here last week, um, uh, one of the, the, the same numbers is, uh, is used in there on, where is it? Verse, let me see here, this is 10... Find it, need to find it, need to find it. Okay. 
can't find it. I think it was nine where we saw it actually last. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I think it was nine. I'm not going to look that far back. But we've seen, we've seen the equivalent of this before, 42 months, 1,260 days, the time, times, and half a times. Okay? All these are the same. They're, they're, they're the same amount of time. They're just described uh, whether in months, they're years, or they're in the times, okay, which means a year. Okay? Uh, in Daniel 7.25, it had an intermediate fulfillment in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? That is uh, this idea of, of, uh, of the three and a half years, okay? The, we've already seen this fulfilled in one sense, okay? The Jews were given into his hand for a times, times and half a time, okay? That's equal to three and a half years, which is the equivalent of 42 months, okay? Which is also the equivalent of 1,260 days. The Jewish calendar is 30 days a month, okay? So then when you do the math, you get that, Okay? Daniel's prophecy is also further expanded upon by Christ in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and in Luke 21. In Luke 21, 24 in particular, okay, Jesus speaks of a time when Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. Okay? We've seen that already partially fulfilled in AD 70. Okay, that was partially fulfilled when, when, the, when the Romans came in, the, you know, the, the Gentiles, they came in and they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. But in one sense, what we're seeing now from Revelation and then looking back on the Gospels is that what happened in AD 70 is a miniature picture of what would happen in the future on a larger scale. Okay, that was kind of like a mini picture of what would happen on a larger scale worldwide. Okay, that the people of God, in a, in a sense, the temple would be destroyed. It would come under attack. All right. The book of Revelation, okay. In the book of Revelation, oh, um, yeah, okay, well, let me speak about AD 70, okay. When that was fulfilled, okay, that signaled that, uh, God's full and final rejection of the ethnic nation of Israel as his people, and it confirmed that the church was God's people. Okay, the church was God's people. So this this kind of uh, going back to the Old Testament, when God allowed Babylon to destroy the temple the first time, that also showed God's rejection of the Jews of that time that He was going to start over again with a remnant. Okay, but now in AD seventy, this is uh, this is God's visible final rejection uh, of the nation of Israel as His people, and that He's moved on to the church since the day of Pentecost. His spirit has been with the church and not inside the temple, okay? So the 42 days, um, the 42 days is equivalent to the 1,260 days in verse 3 as well as the 1,260 days in chapter 12, 6. Okay, we'll get to that in two weeks and we'll be in chapter 12. But if you read chapter 12 now, you'll see that, that uh, the same amount of time is described in different ways, okay? But there's no way to confuse that that is the, the, the same time period. Okay. G.K. Bill, he also suggests that the time is stated in this way to allude to the ministry of Elijah. Elijah, it says it didn't reign in Israel for three and a half years. Okay, so here's part of our Old Testament hint. Okay, he, uh, uh, the witnesses, you are, you, you know, in reading it, you've already seen there's some power to shut the skies. That's Elijah. That was part of what he did. He was able to shut the skies. You know, he prayed and it didn't, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Okay, that was part of his power. So that's part of uh, why this is referenced uh, this way. So let's go on to, to the witnesses and their ministry. Okay, it says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. All right, now Revelation uh, Revelation 11, 3 through 6, it explains the primary purpose of the measure. Why are they measured? Why are they taken care of? Okay? That is, God's establishment of his presence among his end time community as his sanctuary is aimed to ensure the effective prophetic witness of his people. Okay? The reason why God is taking care of his church so that we don't disappear off the face of the earth and lose our faith is so we can witness. 
Okay, it's not here. We're in in a sense, we're not here on earth to have a good time. <laughs> okay, we're here to be his witnesses. We're here to do his work. You know, something you can see if we try to build our life on everything, uh, for everything just here on earth, for the here and now, we're missing God's calling. We're missing God's calling. You know, our, our job here is to witness to Him. We've been doing a lot of sniffing. Probably have. <laughs> You know, and I mean, and the images of the of the churches in uh, the seven churches, you know, uh, the picture of the of the church as a whole, just from those seven churches, is that the church doesn't doesn't bear its light, you know, very well sometimes. You know, it, we don't bear our light very well. We're either trying to look too much like the world, or the world is infiltrating us, or false teaching is infiltrating, or we're too harsh, you know, or we're so right that we're really wrong, <laughs> you know. Or we just don't care enough. We're complacent, you know. We're we're neither hot nor cold, you know. Those are the images of of the church, you know. Or we're suffering and faithful, you know. And there were two churches that were suffering and faithful, you know. So as a whole, you know, we don't do very well, but yet that's our call. That's our call is to witness, is to be light bearers, to bear that light. Just as John is commissioned in Revelation ten to take the scroll and to eat it, as his own prophetic. Commission. These two witnesses are authorized and commissioned to prophesy spiritual judgment against their persecutors. Okay. Now, who are these two witnesses? Okay. Uh, a lot of popular interpretation. In fact, I remember seeing uh, the Omega Code. Did you guys ever see that movie years ago? You remember that one? You know, that was like one of the first big Christian hits in the movie theaters, and you know, everybody went to go see it multiple times. You know, just to make a make a cultural statement, you know, I went to go see it three times, why lie? <laughs> you know, but, uh, but in that movie, you know, the two witnesses, I don't remember if they, if they stated their names or not, but they're two literal men in, in, the, in the movie. They're, they were two literal men, and, and, and they confronted the, uh, uh, the Antichrist in, in that movie, and, you know, they were shot and killed and raised to life and, you know, getting all the pictures in my head, okay? But a lot of popular interpretations... Uh, say that these are either Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch or any other combination of these prophets. Okay? Elijah and Enoch are usually picked because those are the two people in the Old Testament that, that didn't see death. If you remember in, in, back, in, uh, uh, back in Genesis, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Okay? And then Elijah was taken away in, in, like a, in like a chariot of fire or something like that that just came and, and swooped him up you know, and, and right in front of Elijah who saw that. You know, so they didn't die. So the idea was that, oh, well, that means that they can come back. You know, and Moses, people pick Moses because uh, some of the descriptions of the powers uh, of these witnesses, one of them has the powers of Moses, the plagues in Egypt. Okay, so they say, well, it was Moses, you know, well, Moses, and, Moses and Enoch or Moses and Elijah, you know. So they start making different combinations from there. Okay, uh, another interpretation, I, and again, I, I think going with the symbolic aspect, is that these represent the whole community of faith whose primary function is to be witnesses. Okay? In a sense, the two witnesses is a way of saying church. The two witnesses are the church. Okay? Not two specific individuals, the entire church. And we'll see why they're called two in a little bit. Okay? But let's look at a couple of reasons. Okay? So there are six reasons why I think we can look at these as the church and not two particular individuals. Okay? Reason one, the witnesses are called two lampstands in verse four. Okay? They are the two lampstands. Okay? Lampstands, if you remember back in Revelation 120, so we've already settled this, they're churches. The lampstands are the churches to bear the light of Christ. Okay? That Old Testament reference was from Zechariah 4, verses 1 through 14, and there, Zechariah's lampstands, they symbolized God's presence in the temple. Okay? So in, a, uh, in Zechariah 4, the lampstand with its seven lamps is a figurative, or a, what they call a synecdoche, okay? Where, part of a, uh, where a part stands for the whole. Okay, and so that, that's a, a grammatical or a literary device, okay? But we're part of the, uh, there in Zechariah 4, one piece of the temple furniture stood for the whole temple, okay? That's what, the, that's what that meant. And here it was the, 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 like the menorah, okay? 
That stood for the whole temple in Zechariah 4. The main point of Zechariah 4 was the divine assurance that the opposition will be overcome and the temple completed. Remember, Zechariah is written uh, when Israel is out of captivity. They've come out of Babylon, and they're trying to rebuild the temple, but they're facing lots of opposition. Okay, uh, The Edomites and a bunch of other people, they don't want them to rebuild the temple, so they're making these raids on Jerusalem. Okay, trying to prevent them from building the temple. And Zechariah, the word that he gets is basically uh, is that the temple we will be rebuilt. That despite the opposition, God's spirit would be with them so that the work of the temple would be completed and the people would see it. Okay, so now here, okay, new Israel, the church, is also to draw its power from the spirit. What is Zechariah 4, 6? Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit says the Lord. Now that's for the church. That's how we do our work too. From the divine presence before God's throne in its drive to stand against the world's resistance. That's where we find our power. It's from the Spirit. So when we're called the lampstands here, this is, this is all the imagery that should be coming up. Okay, it takes us all right back to Zechariah 4. So consequently, the lampstand, which is the church, is given power by the seven lamps on it, okay, a power primarily to witness as light. Okay, that's what we're supposed to be. We, you, know, what did you, you know, we're supposed to be light in the world, the salt of the earth. You know, was it in Matthew 5, I believe? I don't remember the exact verse, but I want to say it's Matthew 5, where Jesus said something that if you have a light, you don't put that under a basket and hide it. Okay, you let that light show. That's what this is calling us to. That's, uh, that's the witness, that's the mission. Okay. Now this also suggests that the new temple has been inaugurated in the church. Okay. So again, another theme that we're seeing throughout the New Testament is that the church is God's Israel. Okay. We're the true spiritual Israel. We are, in a sense, the, the temple that Ezekiel looked forward to is here and now in its beginning stages. It's, it's the temple being built, in a sense, from the inside out. Okay, and we'll see the final expression of the temple. When we, when we get to Revelation uh, 21 and 22, then we see the temple. Okay, the, the Jerusalem that comes down, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, it's in the shape of a cube, which is the shape of the Holy of Holies. Okay, that was in the shape of a cube. And that's going to be our new home. The, you know, that's going to be it, where the entire, uh, all of creation is going to be God's temple. The entirety of creation is all God's temple. Okay. All right, so I think, uh, you know, part of the, the identification there is pretty solid, I, I think, from Zechariah 4, okay? Uh, but uh, just uh, some other things that come into play. Uh, just as the lampstands are identified as a kingdom and priest, as is the entire church in Revelation 5.10, so 11.4 associates the witness with kingly and priestly functions as well, okay? Now, reason number two, okay? Uh, verse 7 looking ahead a little bit, but, but verse 7 says that the beast will make war with them and overcome them. Okay, this is based on Daniel 7.21. If you remember the fourth beast that comes up out of the sea. Okay, the last evil kingdom prophesied by Daniel. It persecutes not an individual. Okay, it persecutes the entire nation of Israel. So basically going off of that, if, if Revelation is just updating Daniel and we're on the last beast, the revelation persecutes an entire people group, not just a couple of individuals. Okay, so that would lead us to see uh, that the that the witnesses here that, that this is a larger group. This is not just two. Okay, uh, reason number three: the corporate interpretation uh, is pointed to by the statements uh, as pointed to by the statements in verses nine to thirteen that the entire world would be seeing these unbelievers and see their dead bodies in the streets. Okay. Uh, that because the entire world is going to be seeing them, that this can't just be two people because the entire world can't see two people at a time. Okay? Now, uh, Beale, he recognizes this. You know, with uh, certain interpreters, uh, dispensational futurists will kind of say, well, we have TVs now, so we can get that done. So uh, that reason doesn't have weight for a lot of people, and that's how they did it in the, uh, in the movie, The Omega Code, when the, when the two witnesses were dead. They showed them on TV... And when they were brought back to life, that happened on national television in the movie. And, you know, therefore everybody saw it. So that's how, how they played out uh, that scene. But uh, anyway, I, I think that's still, that's still a strong reason because John obviously didn't know about TV. 
<laughs> you know, so it, how would John have understood that the entire world was going to see these, uh, see these witnesses, you know, uh, lying in the streets and stuff like that? He didn't have TV in mind. I don't think we should either when we interpret it. Okay. Uh, reason number uh, four. The two witnesses prophesy for three and a half years, which is the same, the same length of time that the holy city, the woman, and those tabernacling in heaven are to be oppressed. Okay, so this is taking some different portions of Revelation, combining it, putting it all together. Okay, it, the witnesses, uh, the woman, as we'll see in Revelation 12, and those tabernacling uh, in heaven, if that's all happening at the same time, and if those are the same people, which I think will, will be easily shown, okay, then this is not two individuals. This is a corporate group. Okay? Uh, also, uh, elsewhere, here we go, often elsewhere in the book, the entire community of believers is identified as a source of testimony to Jesus. That is, nowhere in Revelation is a single individual commanded out. Eric, you must prophesy. <laughs> no, it, it's, not, it's not like that. The same commission is given to the entire church at a time. Okay? And finally, a final hint that these prophets are not two individuals comes from observing that the powers of both Moses and Elijah are attributed to both the two witnesses equally. Okay? They're not divided among them. It doesn't say, well, one had the power to do this and the other had the power to do that. Both uh, the two witnesses are described as having the powers equally. Okay? So, so uh, as G.K. Bill said, he said, they are identical prophetic twins. Okay. So Bill is, is saying that the two witnesses were Moses and Elijah. Well, they have their, they're described with their powers, okay. is, what, is what we'll see. But he, no, he, he's saying that, that, the, that the church as a whole is, is, comprises the two witnesses. They comprise the two witnesses. Okay? And here's, here's some interesting reasons why. Okay? Why two witnesses? Okay? Why is the church described as two witnesses? Why isn't it described as one witness? Would be, in a sense, a question asked. Why, does it, why is it called two witnesses? Okay? Uh, this was interesting. Okay? The number two is significant from the Old Testament law requiring at least two witnesses as a just basis for judging an offense against the law. Okay? So maybe you've read that. I, I want to say that uh, it, there, there's even uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, I think Jesus quotes this a bit, but, uh, but the idea behind the law was that whenever you made an accusation, in particular uh, uh, for a capital crime, you couldn't put someone to death. You couldn't judge them if there was only one witness. There had to be at least two. There had to be at least two. In, or, in order for you to have a case, there had to be at least two. Okay? So the idea here, then, is that, that the church is described as two witnesses because, in a sense, the church as a whole is the witness against the world. The church as a whole is witness against the world. And in the testimony of the church is going to be used against the world as part of their judgment that God deals out. Because of the two witnesses. Yeah, because we, com yeah, because we comprise two witnesses. So that's one aspect. This was another possible reason, and I found this interesting too. Uh, another possible reason for the number two is that only two lampstands or churches among the, seven, uh, among the seven letters of the churches are not rebuked for some inadequacy in their witness. Okay, remember, only two churches out of seven were faithful. Only two out of the seven were faithful. Three were, uh, were compromising and two were like basically, we're going to take your lampstand away. We're going to de-church you. Okay? Those were uh, the churches in Philadelphia and, and Smyrna. Those were the only two faithful churches. So that was another reason, that, you know, internal uh, within the book of Revelation itself, is that only two out of the seven, you know, again, symbolically, were, were faithful churches, were the ones that were witnessing uh, faithfully against their culture and against the world. Okay? So let's take a little excursus here. Okay, uh, you all know the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, everybody let it shine, let it. there we go. Here's our question, okay, how well is our light shining? Are we explicitly Christian, that is, do we make every effort to live out the gospel and apply the gospel to every aspect of our lives? Many Christians today have fallen for the trap that there is a sacred sphere 
of life where religious things are appropriate, and then there's a secular sphere where religion doesn't belong. Okay? And we let culture dictate this to us. You know, sometimes like, well, leave your church at home. Or, you know, they, they, they say stuff like that. Leave your religion at home. You know, oh, we're at the workplace. You know, you don't bring your church stuff in here. And the world asks us to separate religion from the secular. But in the Bible, this, that's foreign. All life is religious. All life is sacred. There are no compartments, in a sense, where God does not have authority. Where God does not say something to. Nobody's left out. Yeah. No, nobody's left out, and no thing in our lives is left, is left out. You know, the Bible, in a sense, the Bible speaks to us, and, you know, and it may not be like directly or explicitly, uh, but God speaks to how we should work. God speaks to how we should date, to how we should marry, to, to how we should play, to how we should do our recreation, you know, uh, to how, in one sense, to how we should drive. To every single thing that we do, God speaks to, you know, and the world tells us to separate it. Hey, just do that on Sunday. You know, that's for Sunday. That's for church only. You know, don't bring that in here. You know, that usually happens in politics. You know, and, and uh, you know, the government tell you, you know, that's religious stuff that doesn't belong in politics. It's like, uh, no, it, it belongs here because God speaks to it. Usually, uh, it's there, yeah, the Bible doesn't make distinction. We must live to be light to a dark world. This includes sharing the gospel message of faith and repentance. So that's just something for us to think about, you know. I, I, and this is why I'm so glad that I, I think I'm pretty much just going to settle that we're going to do it. Why we're going to do again the prodigal God? Why we're going to do the gospel in life? Because that's what that's about: is learning how to integrate faith and the gospel into every single thing that we do, you know, and not leaving it separate. You know, we miss out on so much. You know, uh, trying to keep the gospel separate from everything that we do. You know, so we need to learn how to integrate that and how to live out the gospel every, uh, in every single aspect of our life. All life is sacred and is to be lived. Coram Dei, that's a Latin phrase that means before the face of God. Before the face of God, we must live to be light to this dark world. That the witnesses are clothed in sackcloth. That suggests uh, mourning over the judgment that their message will result in. This is the bitterness of, of what John experienced. You know, I mean, it's, it's not fun. It should never be fun to tell somebody, you know, if you don't repent, you know, if you don't repent, if you don't turn from your sins, if you don't turn to Christ, the only thing that's left is hell and judgment. That's a hard message. It's not a popular message. <laughs> you know, even uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, as, as much as he... Uh, as much as, uh, you know, he's pretty much just noted for sinners in the hands of an angry God. From what I understand, those were the minority sermons that he had. He only had like 12 sermons out of a couple of hundred, you know, on judgment. You know, why? They're hard messages, period. I, I, I had the opportunity to teach that on English. Yes. Yeah. Did you know that he preached monotone? Wow. Yeah, he read his sermons. Uh, a lot of the Puritans did. He read his sermons, and he preached monotone. And when people would weep and wail, he would tell them to be quiet so that they could preach God's word. Oh, my God. Very interesting. But this was neat because uh, the reason why they did that was that they didn't want to attribute anything to their own, in a sense, like speaking ability. They wanted it all to be God's spirit. So they read, and they read in monotone. And that, that happened, I mean, in a monotone, <laughs> you know, sermon, you know, you know the Spirit of God was there. <laughs> you know that the Spirit of God was there. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. But, you know, that's, that's just a bitter message. You know, I mean, period, talking about that. You know, it's, it, and even, I mean, even for me, it's so much easier to talk about applying the gospel and living out the gospel and how people need the gospel in order to, you know, in order to, 
uh, to really find joy and to really find happiness in their life than it is to tell people, if you don't live out the gospel, if you don't have the gospel, you're going to hell. You know, that's just a lot harder message, period. You know, and, and so telling people to repent, you know, the fact that you have to tell people you need to change, you know, people, I mean, even ourselves, you know, we're so used to thinking, I'm perfect. People should accept me just the way I am. And it's like, God doesn't. God asks us to repent. And he asks us to change because there's things in us that are not right. And uh, just confronting people to repent is to tell them already, you need some work. And nobody likes to hear that. <laughs> nobody likes to hear that. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. You know, and that's part of the bitterness that, you know, that John knew he was going to experience. And this is part of uh, the sackcloth, that, you know, the, the prophets of the Old Testament. And people, when they would wear sackcloth, that was a sign of mourning. You know, it was a sign that they were going through some repentance. And that's, that's what the call is. That's what these witnesses are described as wearing. Okay. So the, uh, the judicial context of two witnesses for a valid testimony, it stresses judgment more than repentance. Okay, it kind of takes us to a courtroom scene. Okay, it stresses judgment more than repentance, but this could also be alluding, uh, again, I've already mentioned, uh, back to the bitterness after eating the scroll that John experienced. Okay, it, it's just, it's, it's a tough one. Now, going on, it says, and if anyone would harm them, so this is the part where we wish we all had these powers, right? <laughs> if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now, the main point of this is that the witnesses are spiritually protected, having been measured as part of the temple. Okay, While we may undergo bodily, economic, political, or social harm, our eternal covenant status with God will not be affected. Okay? Now, the fire that pours out of their mouths, okay, that we're, we don't each have <laughs> fire breathing powers, okay? We shouldn't take that literally, okay? It's best viewed as the legal pronouncement of the ensuing judgment of the enemies. That is, this indictment is actually a beginning phase of that judgment, and so at least to that extent, it sets it in motion. If you remember, like Jesus, when he has eyes like flames of fire, that was symb uh, symbol uh, symbolic for judgment. Okay, part of our part of the witness of the church when the church proclaims that if you don't repent, you are under the judgment of God. Okay, in a sense, what, what the what Revelation is saying here is that that message is the beginning of the judgment against the world. Okay. So in, in a sense, uh, hell is something that starts here. It starts in this life for people too. And some of, the, some of the things that people experience in this life, that unbelievers experience in this life, are a foretaste of hell to come. In the Old Testament, a lot of the, 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 um, uh, the, the harem, uh, the command to destroy and kill every single you know, Canaanite and stuff like that, those are all hints and images of the further destruction that would come in the lake of fire. In a sense, it's, an it's, a, it's a small view, a preview of judgment to come. That happens in this life. When the church says, you know, if you don't repent, you're going to hell, that starts here. That starts here. Some of the imagery uh, regarding the witnesses here we've already seen in Zechariah 4, such as the two olive trees, okay? Uh, they're guaranteed to finish the work of rebuilding the temple that is assigned to them. Okay, so that's one of the images. But also, the ministry of Elijah is alluded to here. Okay, it's alluded to here as he prophesied against the false prophets and the prophets of Baal. Okay, it's during the reign of Ahab and Ahaziah. The imagery of fire coming down from heaven is from 2 Kings 1, 5 through 18. Okay, this is when uh, one of the kings, he was summoning... Elijah, and so he sent, like, battalions of troops. Hey, go get me that guy. And they were, hey, you know, knock on his door or whatever. <laughs> you need to come with us now. Oh, I do? And fire would come down and devour these guys every single time. Elijah would command that the fire would come down, and it, it devoured them until finally one guy came up and, like, please, sir, 
you know, uh, spare my life, be kind, my master's calling you, you know, I'm just doing my job, okay, <laughs> you know, and Elijah didn't call fire down from heaven there, uh, but that's where the reference is from there. Uh, likewise, in Jeremiah 5.14, God tells Jeremiah, I am making my word in your mouth a fire, and this people would, and the fire shall consume them. Elijah also, he prayed that the sky would be shut and that it would not rain in Israel for three and a half years. That's from 1 Kings uh, 17.1. You can also see that in James 5.17 and Luke 4.25. The plagues of Moses are alluded to also as well, and the waters turning to blood, which was a form of judgment against the gods of Egypt. Okay, So here, the judicial role of Moses and Elijah is emphasized, that it, in a sense, the connection that they had to do with the law. Okay, both of the inflictions, shutting the sky and waters to blood, were responses to the kings who persecuted God's people. The plagues were not intended to induce repentance, but were the punishments of the kings who were hardened and intractable. What are these sorts of judgments? Um, it's hard to say, but uh, they're not literal, okay, so that we don't really stop the rain, okay, we're in the valley, we need water in Falcon, <laughs> right, <laughs> we need water in our reservoir, so that's that's not what it's mean, okay, or we don't turn waters into blood, okay, rather, what these judgments are, what they, what they do, they're divinely ordained events intended to remind the persecutors that their idolatry is folly, that they are separated from the living God, and that they are already experiencing an initial form of judgment. Such events cause them to live in fear and in terror in response to their desperate plight. Here, go back to, um, you go back to uh, Revelation 8 and 9 in the trumpets and the torments that unbelievers experience. Okay? In a sense, this is the way I best understood it. They're the things that should make unbelieving idolaters go, hmm, I think my religion and what I'm living for is folly. Okay? It's basically those things, all right? It, you know, so, I mean, we've seen it. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you see people that, uh, you know, are very much uh, against God, against Christianity in particular, and there are things that happen in their life, you know, based on what they believe, and all of a sudden that turns around on them and kind of judges them back, okay? Um, here's one example. Uh, I, I find this uh, just ironic all the time, but I think this is a form of it. Uh, in Buddhism, Buddhism teaches that the way that you alleviate from suffering is is, is uh, by removing attachment to things that bring suffering. Okay, um, <laughs> it's kind of ironic, but uh, that whole following that path, the eightfold path, and you know the the four noble truths and stuff like that, following that is itself a form of suffering because you have to adhere to it, you know, religiously, basically. And if you don't, well, you're not a good Buddhist. And so suffering really never ends because you're always, you know, uh, inflicting yourself with, you know, uh, with thoughts of not being good enough. And so it doesn't work out. And at some point, that cycle should, you know, it should be one of those things that, that says, maybe uh, I've got the wrong idea. Maybe I'm in the wrong religion. You know, and so these sorts of things, you know, people living for the wrong things, and as they see those things crumble before them, you know, as they see those things being swept out from underneath their feet and their life falling, it, it should let them know, I need a better life foundation. And these are those sorts of judgments that, you know, part of our prayers as we pray for vindication and as we pray for justice, and then as the prayers of the saints in heaven are praying too, that's how God responds is he responds to them with judgments that start to happen here. And those judgments, they, they harden them, but it should also lead them to repentance. It should cause them to say, my way is not good. You know, I should consider what Christ says. I should turn to him and I should believe on him. And some do and some don't. But that's, that's part of the power that we have. It's, a, it's our prayers. Our prayers to bring about things in this life. Right? That's why we pray for people to be saved. You know? We pray for people to be saved, and, and it's good to, for us to pray, God, take away their idols so that all they see is that you are the true living God. And taking away their idol hurts, you know. It hurts, but sometimes it's what, it's what people need in order to see God. So these judgments, they're, they're probably also similar to the ones described by the first six trumpets, okay. Now, uh, very quickly, got some quick ground to cover, okay. 
um, the last few verses, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie on the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. So uh, this first uh, phrase, it takes us near the end of history, it seems. Okay, It's a time when the number of Christians that have been gathered and, uh, and the elect will have been sealed, they've been marked, they've been measured, uh, their witnessing is done. So apparently there's going to come a point, you know, kind of like in Matthew 24, when the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. Okay? When it has gone to, to everywhere that it needs to go. And then in Matthew it says, that, and then the end will come. Okay? So once this gospel has been preached, then the end comes. Okay? Now the reference to the beast goes back to Daniel 7, because we need to keep that in mind all the time. Okay? The beast in Daniel 7 represents evil kings and kingdoms that persecute the saints. Okay? So basically, this is worldwide persecution. Okay, this is worldwide persecution of the church. We see persecution right now in particular areas, you know, and I mean we start to see it grow here. But for the most part, I mean, Christians in the United States can't say that we're persecuted like Christians in North Korea. Okay, we're nowhere near that level. But at some point, worldwide persecution of the church will be taking place. The idea of the dead bodies lying in the streets is that the church will no longer be witnessing, in a sense, you know, or we're very insignificant, okay? It will, the church will appear small and insignificant. Maybe the church will be driven underground. In a sense, maybe we'll be, you know, worshiping in caves again and meeting in houses secretly, you know? I don't know, but, but at some point, you know, the, the church, it, it appears to be dead. It appears to be dead, Okay? And now notice that the great city, so okay, now it's not called the holy city, but the great city, here it's Jerusalem, okay, for the city where their Lord was crucified. John, he explicitly says that it is symbolic for Sodom in Egypt, okay, so this is another, you know, another instance where, where the uh, Jerusalem, the Jews are rejected, okay, they're rejected, now they're called Sodom and Egypt, okay, that it is called Sodom and Egypt is meant to liken it to other wicked nations of the world where the saints lived and were oppressed as strangers. Think of Lot and Sodom, okay? And then obviously Israel in, uh, in Egypt, okay? So these cities, they represent the ungodly world that persecuted God's people and even God himself in Jesus Christ, okay? But after three and a half days, last two verses, but after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, notice that the apparent victory of the beast is only three and a half days. Okay, it's described as three and a half days, but remember, that's the same time period as 1,260 days, and the same time period as 42 months, and the same time as uh, a time, times, and times and a half. But you notice that now describing it in terms of days, in a sense, it gives you the idea that it's a shortened point, or it's a shortened time. Okay, what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? You know, those days are going to be shortened for the sake of the elect. You know, basically, the entire church will not disappear off the face of the earth. Even though it might be reduced down to a remnant, the entire church will not disappear. And then what happens, the idea of the breath of life from God, that's a reference to Ezekiel 37. Remember the valley of dry bones and, his, and Ezekiel's looking at it and God asks him, you know, can these bones live? And, you know, Ezekiel's like, well, I don't know, only you know. But the, the image there, there the dead house of Israel is brought back to life by the breath of God. So what John sees, or what Ezekiel saw, John sees as fulfilled in the church. The church is the restored people of, of God. They're the restored Israel. And, uh, and, and here, being more explicit with the image here, is that this church is dead, but then it's brought back to life. This is the resurrection. 
this is when Christ returns. Okay? This is when the church comes back to life. This is the rapture of the church. It's not mere revivals, okay, that, you know, that have taken place throughout the church age. That's what some people have interpreted this. Your historicists will interpret it this way, that this represented like the Reformation, okay, that it was the church coming back to life. It seemed to disappear in the Dark Ages, but then came back to life in the Protestant Reformation, okay, that's, that's one of the, the interpretations. But no, this is the return of Christ when God breathes life back into the, the bodies of dead saints. They come back to life, and then the entire world fears, okay? The entire world did not fear the Protestant Reformation, okay? The world welcomed the Protestant Reformation, really, okay? Because a lot of the things they brought with it, okay? But here, the world, is, they're going to be in great fear. I mean, obviously, of every, you know, you think about it. If you've been oppressing a people group, and you practically have them wiped out, but then all of a sudden, they all come back to life, yeah, you're going to be a little bit scared, <laughs> you're going to be a little bit like, oh, I, I think we got it wrong. We were on the wrong side, you know. So here when it says this breath of life comes back and they're taken away in a cloud, here this is where we should think First Thessalonians uh, 4, 15 through 17. For this we declare by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That will be, when, when that breath of life comes, that will be the writing of of all wrongs that have taken place. That those who dwell on the earth will be in great fear because they will realize that they are and always have been on the wrong side. As far as the numbers on the earthquake, the partial effect of the earthquake indicates that it's the beginning of the last uh, of the of the last judgment. So in a sense the, the picture that we're getting here is just before the consummation, as Christ is returning, all this turmoil is happening on the earth and people are dying, but not every single unbeliever is killed. Okay, not then and there. They're not. They're not killed, but they're, they're alive to see. Okay, enough. You know uh, that Christ is there, and that they're in deep trouble. So here is our summary. Well, let me get to our summary. Our task. Okay, our task in this time is to witness to Christ and the gospel against the idolatrous culture that we live in. We must witness primarily to and with the gospel message. Okay, there is no substitute for this. You've heard it said, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. That's cool, but the gospel primarily has to come through words. Okay? We can't think our body language preaches the gospel. It shows it, but it doesn't preach the gospel. It shows it, but it doesn't proclaim it. There is no substitute for gospel proclamation. Okay? If you're not good at it, get people to a place, to a church, where they can hear it, okay? But there, but there is no substitute for that. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Secondly, our witness extends to our lives in every facet. How we live, how we marry, how we're single, how we are as employees, how we are when we drive, how we are when we play, when we eat, etc., etc. The Bible says, do all for the glory of God. The gospel has to make its way to every area of our lives. Some of us religiously believe that we are saved, but when we work, we bow to the idols of money and materialism. Some of us are all about grace at church, but our home is filled with legalism. Some of us play church and live the world, or we live church, but play the world. Be a witness. That's the call here. Be a witness. This is our task. May God grant us the strength, the courage, wisdom, and knowledge to be witnesses for Him and to remember that though we will suffer for our witness, though we will suffer apparent defeats, Jesus wins. Amen.